Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Rory Lansman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and this phase of our budget hearing, jointly held with the Committee on Public Safety, will hear from the District Attorneys and the Special Narcotics Prosecutor. We are joined by Council Members Andy King, who is a member of the Committee on the Justice System, oh. and what? Oh, sorry, Andy Cohen. <laughs> the, the, the Andy's from the Bronx. We'll do it to you every time. Um, he's lacking a bow tie. That should have been my first signal. The chairman of the Public Safety Committee said that. Um, the fiscal 2019 preliminary plan includes little to no budget actions for the city's prosecutors and totals $375.6 million with a budgeted headcount of 3,655 positions. This includes $104.4 million and 989 positions for the New York County District Attorney, $97.4 million and 910 positions for the Kings County District Attorney, $72.7 million and 880 positions for the Bronx County District Attorney, only six, no, I don't, I'm not ready to editorial, editorialize yet, $64.1 million and 530 positions for the Queens District Attorney, $14.3 million and 133 positions for the Richmond County District Attorney, and $22.5 million and 213 positions for the Special Narcotics Prosecutor. Budgeted head count across the six offices includes an increase of five positions, two in Richmond County and three in the Bronx, to implement the early victim engagement program with the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice in order to enable victims advocates to do early outreach and engagement of victims of intimate partner violence. I look forward to hearing each office's budget priorities not included in the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget and more specifically on the issues of salary parity, recruitment and retention. And we also hope to follow up on the baseline funds, discuss anticipated asset forfeiture funds and programs and initiatives your offices are participating in. At the outset, let me thank our committee staff for their hard work, Steve Reister and Sheila Johnson from the Finance Division, and Brian Coe and Casey Addison from the Legislative Division. And my staff, my Chief of Staff, Rachel Kagan, my Communications Director, Josh Levitt, my Operations Director, Jordan Bieberman, and my Budget Director, Masis Sarkissian. Um, now uh, we'd like to hear from the Chair of the Public Safety Committee, Donovan Richards. Thank you, Chair Lanceman, and good afternoon, and welcome again to the Joint Public Safety and Justice System Committee hearing on the District Attorneys and Special Narcotics Prosecutor. Uh, as Councilmember Lanceman indicated, fiscal 2018 preliminary plan included no significant budget actions for the city's prosecutors. Uh, I know he went through the numbers, who totals budget equals approximately $375.6 million and a nearly unchanged headcount. As a result, I look forward to hearing uh, the challenges and priorities faced by uh, your offices that are not reflected in the preliminary plan. And in particular, some areas I'm really interested in hearing about are obviously the opioid crisis uh, and how uh, we're working uh, diversion programs, um, special narcotics prosecutor, obviously, on the work you're doing around uh, the opioid crisis and, and gang work. Um, uh, body cameras, and how is the NYPD uh, truly working with you all to make sure that program is successful? And uh, lastly, raise the age, the impact of raise the age and uh, how you're preparing for that. So thank you all for being here today. And I will turn it back over to Council Member, uh, Chair Lanceman. Thank you. Well, let's get to it. If you'd all uh, raise your right hand so you could be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um, you are all encouraged to be brief so that um, you can get on to what else you need to do today and we could all move forward. Um, well, Mr. Vance, since you're at the end there, I nominate you to go first. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Richards and Lanceman and members of the Committees on Public Safety and the Justice System. Thank you so much for hearing from us today and also for your support over the years. Uh, it's been very important to all of us and to our office. Uh, that support, I think we can take stock of, of really how incredible it has been. Your support has 
uh, and investments has led to record crime, low crime levels uh, in the five boroughs. Last year in Manhattan, there were 46 homicides, which was a slight increase since before 2000, since 2016, but a far cry from 70 in 2010 when I took over. And keep in mind that in 2017, uh, we had a tragic uh, a terrorism attack in the Lower West Side where eight people uh, were murdered uh, at that time. And that sad attack was a reminder to all of us that counterterrorism threats are real for this city. And it's for that purpose, in 2015, our office created a counterterrorism program to handle prosecutions against terrorists. And working with NYPD Intel, the office has applied uh, the New York State's terrorism statute to four prosecutions, two of which are pending and two of which have been resolved by, by pleas and convictions. In addition to contributing to record lows in violent crime, um, our office, as have my colleagues, all made criminal justice reform and reducing unnecessary incarceration among our, my highest priorities. As a result, we have drastically reduced the number of prosecutions for low-level offenses in Manhattan. In 2010, my first year as district attorney, there were 85,615 misdemeanor and violation arraignments in Manhattan criminal court. Last year, there were 55,980 arraignments, and that's a 35% reduction. And by the end of 2018, we expect to drive that number even lower due to a number of policy changes and reforms that I'd like to outline today. First, as of February 1st, our office no longer prosecutes turnstile jumping and unlicensed vending except where there's a demonstrated public safety reason to do so. The NYPD can and should to continue enforcement on these offenses through its routine enforcement, and we are monitoring this closely to ensure that anyone who poses a public safety threat will continue to be prosecuted by our office. But for those who do not present a public safety threat, we think the question that those should be resolved uh, with summonses as opposed to summary arrest. Since these reforms went into effect on February 1, we have had an 88% reduction in arraignments for theft of services compared to the same time period last year. Looking ahead, I support the campaign to subsidize Metro cards for the city's poorest riders. Several members of your committee, including I believe both chairs, are also supporters. I hope that the City Council can explore this idea further with the MTA. In January, my office also took a giant step towards reducing unnecessary incarceration by no longer requesting bail in the majority of misdemeanor cases. Under this new policy, which closely tracks one implemented by uh, Eric Gonzalez in Brooklyn last year, Manhattan prosecutors operate from the presumption now that no bail should be requested in misdemeanor and violation cases except in limited circumstances such as cases involving a victim or when to, where a defendant injures a police officer, firefighter, or other public servant. A victim case might be a stalking case or a domestic violence case, for example. To date, bail requests are down 25% as compared to 2017, and we are now exploring ways to expand this policy to categories of felony cases. We're also engaged in conversations with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and the City Council about expanding the eligibility criteria for supervised release. Supervised release is that program where individuals are maintained outside uh, of uh, pretrial detention uh, subject to conditions imposed by the court. Our office provided $13.8 million in asset forfeiture funding to expand this supervised release program citywide in 2016. And I strongly encourage the council to work with the administration to secure additional funding for, for supervised relief, release. We believe that these policies, reducing reliance on monetary bail and a, an expansion of alternatives to detention, such as supervised release, support our goal of closing Rikers Island, one that I fully share with the council. Third, we continue to divert people from the court system through Project Reset, our pre-arrangement diversion program. To date, we have declined to prosecute 807 16 and 17-year-olds first-time arrestees through this program, and another 42 percent participants are currently enrolled. The program has a 98 percent completion rate, and early analyses indicate that it's having an impact on recidivism too. Preliminary analyses indicate that only 6 percent of Project Reset participants were re-arrested within six months after completing the program compared to 9%, 19%, excuse me, of similarly situated 16 and 17 year olds not participating in the program. Beginning on February 1, we expanded the program to people of all ages charged with nonviolent misdemeanors in Manhattan, and we now expect to divert more than 5,700 people from the criminal justice system each year through this program. 
We believe that these diversion options provide critical early interventions to New Yorkers at their first point of contact with our criminal justice system and will prevent thousands of individuals from ever stepping foot in a courtroom or, he or heading on a trajectory that leads to jail or perhaps even to deportation. Building off this portfolio of pre arraignment diversion programs and Staten Island's successful pilot, we are planning for the implementation of Manhattan Hope, which will come online later this spring. The Manhattan Hope pilot, which will serve neighborhoods in the Manhattan North, in Manhattan North, excuse me, will serve approximately 300 people during its first year, including those arrested for possession of controlled substances such as opioids, heroin, cocaine, ecstasy, LSD, and other drugs. Again, we believe there's an opportunity to divert these cases, as has been done in Staten Island, successfully while maintaining public safety and reducing recidivism. Finally, in August of 2017, alongside my DA colleagues in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, we collectively dismissed roughly 645,000 old summons cases, with more than 240,000 of those vacated summons warrants coming from Manhattan. Now, one might conclude that there is a reduced need for prosecutors, given the impact of our reform efforts on our caseloads. And I would like nothing more than to put prosecutors out of business. But the reality is that we are busier than ever focusing on more serious and emerging threats, from cybercrime to counterterrorism, as I mentioned, as well as more traditional violent crimes, from murder to hate crimes, to sex trafficking, to the seemingly intractable problems around domestic violence, as well as crimes involving rooting out financial fraud and corruption. Criminal activity, members of the Council, has become significantly more sophisticated and requires far greater emphasis on proactive investigation and pretrial litigation. Accordingly, prosecutors must decide, must, excuse me, must dedicate a significantly larger amount of time to each case to adequately serve the interests of justice. The prolifer proliferation of digital evidence associated with almost every case, from video footage to emails and text messages, requires substantial resources and staff time to retrieve, analyze, and store. In response to one of the, the, the chair's question, the NYPD body-worn camera initiative is a good example of this challenge. Our office has ex actively participated with the NYPD pilot since it began, and we are learning a great deal regarding resources we need to effectively implement body-worn cameras in our borough. For example, my staff needs to download and organize the video evidence, which can be especially time-consuming, because many videos are shared without clear identifiers that link the video to a specific arrest. Staff must also determine if video should have been shared but was not, and then attempt to secure the missing video from the NYPD. Finally, almost all video files will need redactions performed before they are shared with the defense and the court. And despite advancements in technology, it is an incredibly resource and time-intensive process. Given the expected volume of arrest videos, my staff cannot assume this new responsibility into their current workload. Once fully implemented, we will require 14 additional staffers with a total annual funding need of $650,000. Each day, the evidence on a serious crime languishes is another day a crime victim has to await justice or a defendant has to spend at Rikers Island. In addition to handling an ever more complicated caseload, ADAs must staff an average of 1,100 institutional assignments per month. This means we are obligated to assign prosecutors to courtrooms every day, regardless of whether there are two cases in that courtroom or 200. Institutional assignments include night and weekend intake and arraignment assignments, as well as regular and non-trial court appearances. And unfortunately, it is becoming increasingly difficult to recruit law school graduates to accept positions as assistant district attorneys given the relatively low starting salaries we can offer them. The starting salary of an assistant district attorney in my office is $63,000 a year, which is considerably lower than other public service lawyers, including those in other city agencies like the Law Department and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Given the twin burdens of tremendous law school debt and the cost of living in New York City, many young people simply can't afford to accept the position despite their interests. We are disappointed that the mayor has not addressed this unfair salary parity, but we will continue to work with the mayor's office and the Office of Management and Budget to address what I believe is a critical issue, and I ask for this council's support. The last thing any of our offices want is to have a class of prosecutors comprised only of individuals with independent means or wealth. Prosecutors need to be reflective of the diverse populations they are seeking to serve. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today, and thank you for your continued support of all our offices. Thank you, Judge Clark.
Good afternoon, Chairman Lansman and members of the Justice System Committee and Chairman Richards and members of the Public Safety Committee. It is an honor to appear before you today. The Bronx is my lifelong home, but it's not just a place where I live and serve with, within the, within the com criminal justice system. It is also a borough that identifies with struggle and survival. The Bronx continues to experience high poverty rates, unemployment, homelessness, substance abuse, and language barriers that often bar access to opportunity. All the while, my county also bears an inordinate share of the city's crime. In 2017, a third of the murders in New York City occurred in the Bronx. So far this year, we have the most shootings and shooting victims of all five boroughs. We have 25% of violent crime, yet we only receive about 20% of the city's funding for district attorney's offices. Members of the city council, I am sick and tired of the Bronx being the first in all that is bad and last in all that is good. Given this reality, we are asking this body to increase funding for salary parity, raises, criminal justice reform, and a new unit to address human trafficking. On average, our assistant district attorneys are the lowest paid of all the district attorney's offices in the city. No prosecutor expects to get rich from what he or she is doing, but they should expect equal pay. The ability to earn a salary equal to their counterparts in New York City. These assistants work days, nights, weekends, holidays, and are on 24-hour call for some of the duties. Without question, my assistants are dedicated public servants. They have risen to the challenge despite being stretched and fatigued. But still, the quality of prosecution has improved along with efficiency. We continue to reduce the backlog. We continue to cut arrest to disposition time. But this will not be sustainable without retaining experienced prosecutors. Ultimately, we are making a reasonable request for equitable distribution of funding to raise salaries to achieve parity with the other New York City District Attorney's offices. And I'm asking for the money, and I'm asking for it to happen now. We estimate that it would cost $6.3 million to achieve salary parity. The average salary for assistance within New York City District Attorney's Office is $95,906. The highest is Manhattan at $106,039, following by special, special narcotics, Queens, Staten Island, and Brooklyn. In the Bronx, the average salary is 83,521, which is $12,385 less pay than our colleagues in the other counties. If we compare, the, compare Bronx ADA salaries to other state agents or city agencies, we see, for example, the starting salary in the Bronx is $61,200, while the starting salary at the New York City Law Department is $68,494. This $68,494 salary is even $1,000 more than a Bronx ADA that has four years experience in my office. So a first year in the city law department makes the same as a four-year assistant in my office. If we do not address the salary parity now, the pay gap will only continue to widen. Last year, the average Bronx ADA salary was $8,600 less than the salary of all the other New York City uh, District Attorney's offices. Now, it is over $12,000 less. It is no wonder that 78 ADAs left the office in 2017. Many of them were seasoned prosecutors. We hired 120 first-year assistants to stop the bleed. However, all of those ADAs are inexperienced. This leads to two problems. First, the tenure 
at the office is shrinking. The average tenure at the time of resignation now is five and a half years. And the average experience level of an assistant DA working in the Bronx is now three years and eight months. We must retain the people in whom we have invested training and opportunity. Otherwise, we do not reap the benefits of the substantial investment of training, which is skill and experience. As far as raises are concerned, as demonstrated, attrition is on the rise. We addressed this last year, requesting an increase in salary and raises, but we did not receive the funding. And so far, there's no funding now in the budget by the mayor. As a direct result, we continue to suffer from high attrition, which adversely affects the efficiency of the criminal justice system and public safety. Last year, we reassigned 1,896 cases of those ADAs who resigned. The total cost of duplicating work to bring all these cases to trial-ready status is more than $4 million in lost productivity. Consequently, this has the effect of undermining the vertical prosecution model that we instituted in the office. After salary parity, raises will provide the financial incentive for experienced assistants to remain in service of the office and will maximize the efficiency of the training of these assistants. Next, I'd like to turn to criminal justice reform. The timing could not be more crucial for addressing parity and raises. We are in the midst of a landmark moment in criminal justice reform. We support sensible reforms that promote fairness and build confidence in the justice system for the communities we serve. We prosecutors are increasing our obligation to do more to ensure justice. My office has stepped up and embraced changes to both bail and discovery. These areas of criminal justice reform align with my philosophy and practice of pursuing justice with integrity. As to bail reform, I have stated before that if we are not asking for jail, we should not be asking for bail. In other words, bail and jail should not be used as a tool for leverage, and accused financial hardship should not be the sole reason for loss of freedom. Our bail policy ensures that we give each case a fair evaluation at arraignments and on every adjournment date throughout the life of the case. As with all my policies, initiatives, and new practices, I am thorough, deliberate, and transparent. Training and forums are being conducted throughout the office before the official rollout of any of these policies, and I will be doing that in the next couple of weeks. The benefits of bail reform transcend fundamental fairness. There are collateral consequences like reductions in the population at Rikers Island and an increased demand for alternatives to incarceration. My office has been at the forefront of meeting these challenges by responding to programs like HOPE, which we have been promised is going to be coming to the Bronx this year as well as what I call OR, the Overdose Avoidance and Recovery Program, as well as Project Reset, which will be uh, formulated in the Bronx by way of a neighborhood justice circles. Our Alternatives to Incarceration Bureau staffs these programs and assesses the needs of low-level offenders struggling with mental illness, substance abuse, and homelessness while addressing low-level crimes with diversion and assisting with re-entry after incarceration. The ATI Bureau initiated OR, that was New York City's first court program to divert substance abuse users into treatment without the, ne the necessity of pleading guilty to a crime. This effort focuses on the population of long-time substance abusers who commit petty crimes in relation to their addiction and helps end the cycle of coming in and out of the system by providing them with treatment. To this point, OR is saving lives. Thus far, we've had 95 people screen in our court for OR, and the program now has 50 people in treatment. The ATI Bureau currently only has two ADAs. We need three more, as well as five clinicians, at a cost of $539,000. 
ATI's diversion programs are saving the city money on, mul on multiple fronts, in the court system and Rikers Island. These programs continue toward the goal of closing Rikers Island. These reforms are positively affecting public safety and the quality of life in our community, which is always our top priority. Most importantly, our ATI initiatives are saving lives. As to discovery reform, another important priority is discovery reform. We believe that collecting and disclosing discovery material earlier in the life of a criminal case will improve the quality of our prosecutions and ultimately reduce the number of wrongful convictions. These are lessons learned from my Conviction Integrity Unit. Early discovery practices will enable us to come to terms with the strengths and challenges of our cases, to make more realistic and more appropriate plea offers, and to be ready for trial sooner. We need trial preparation assistance, or TPAs, to support our prosecutors' effort to turn over documents timely. We are asking for funding to hire 26 new TPAs at a cost of $1,066,936. The current ratio of ADAs to TPAs in my office is 10 to 1. Other New York City District Attorney's offices have a ratio of three ADAs to one TPA. We would like to bring our ratio to five to one. Increasing the speed and scope of discovery cannot occur without an increase in resources to facilitate expanding disclosure obligations. The office has to gather, copy, review, and assess all documents deemed in our custody and control while simultaneously reviewing the tidal wave of video from body-worn cameras and surveillance cameras. In order to process NYPD's body-worn camera footage, where we are anticipating an increase of 860% eight, increase from one tour or one shift in five precincts to 48 tours covering all 16 Bronx commands. The office will need four body-worn camera coordinators at a cost of $170,000 and six video technicians at a cost of $300,018. Further, we need detective investigators to retrieve the expanding category of video avail available from surveillance cameras. And as you may have heard from the defense bar during your hearing on criminal discovery, this is an area that causes the greatest delay. As such, we are requesting $530,440 for 10 additional detective investigators. In addition, you must consider that video and technology comes with all the formatting and te technological hiccups that are currently addressed by IT. We need IT developers and programmers to meet these technological challenges. We ask for five new staffers at a cost of $650,000, plus $50,000 to retain veteran programs. As to my request for human trafficking unit, I would note that the despicable crime of human trafficking is on the rise in the Bronx. Currently, we have two DAs specifically working on these cases, and there are 100 pending investigations into human trafficking and sex trafficking. I am asking for funding to establish a human trafficking unit with a director, four ADAs, and a social worker. We have funding for two ADAs, but we need funding for the other positions at a cost of $320,000. While the cost is significant, we believe that the Bronx deserves every effort made to stamp out slavery of women and children. The Bronx DA's office has had a number of novel, novel accomplishments over the past year and continues to good steward, be a good steward of the taxpayers' money. We created the first-of-a-kind domestic violence complaint room and expanded the hours to nights and weekends to serve more of these victims more compassionately and efficiently. We are the first borough in the city to have the strangulation initiative, a unique partnership with NYPD to help prevent domestic violence homicides because strangulation is the bellwether of escalating abuse. We are the first office in the city to offer treatment before entering a guilty plea through the OR program, as I mentioned earlier, 
which Chief Judge Janet D. Fiore praised in her State of the Judiciary speech, and she wanted to see it duplicated in other counties. We created the Property Release Unit, which oversaw 3,500 requests for the return of property seized and ensured an office-wide rate of compliance at 99.6%. The success of the Property Release Unit has become a model for other district attorney's offices. Other accomplishments that reflect our judicious use of resources to implement a 21st century prosecutor mission of public safety, diverting people from criminal justice system and community outreach includes dismissing of 160,000 summonses, summons warrants that were over 10 years old, as was mentioned by DA Vance, hosting the Another Chance event, which was a warrant forgiveness program where 226 summonses were dismissed and providing the first child safety fair. All of these accomplishments are due in part to an extraordinary support staff and ADAs who continue to work tirelessly and act on the criminal justice reforms, along with meeting the extending obligations required by a 21st century model of prosecution. As my assistants continue to prosecute cases with integrity, as I expect of them, at minimum, I am certain that you agree that they should be compensated fairly, equitably, and with parity. In closing, I just want to stress that we cannot underestimate the impact that funding this office has on the Bronx community. People of the Bronx understand struggle, they survive and overcome the odds every day. I cannot let the people of the Bronx down. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of salary parity. I only ask for what the people of the Bronx deserve, a fair pay for my staff, funding for criminal justice reforms, and the creation of a human trafficking unit. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. McMahon. Good afternoon. Uh, and thank you for having us. Uh, it's an, indeed an honor and a pleasure for me to sort of come home uh, to the city council and see so many uh, former and current colleagues, if you will. Uh, and we thank you uh, all for your interest in our work. Uh, I want to thank in particular uh, the chair of the Committee on Justice System, Rory Lansman, and the chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Donovan Richards, and for those of you who are here today, for your hard uh, work and time in presiding over today's preliminary budget hearing. I also want to acknowledge and thank the new Speaker of the City Council, Corey Johnson, for his leadership. We all look forward to working with each of you to improve our criminal justice system and better protect and serve the people of the City of New York. I also want to give a shout out and thank Staten Island's delegation, uh, led by Councilmember Debbie Rose, Minority Leader Steve Matteo, and Councilmember Joe Borelli for their ongoing advocacy on behalf of the people of Staten Island and their continued support of the Richmond County District Attorney's Office. Now, just halfway through my first term, I, I mean, my term, I didn't mean to say first term. <laughs> I reflect with great pride on the work we have accomplished in revitalizing the Richmond County DA's Office in the last two years. As you may remember, and certainly the staff does because we hectored them every day, when we came in, we were facing a, a mountain of significant challenges uh, in fiscal year 2017, and I requested an historic increase in Richmond County DA's budget to bring the office into the 21st century with a prosecutorial model that seeks to not only prosecute crime, but prevent it as well. This required new bureaus and staff, new technology, innovative programming, uh, and a community partnership unit. In many ways, this meant bringing the Staten Island DA's office into parity with services and programming offered in the other boroughs. We are extremely grateful to have received funding from the city that acknowledged these needs and that allowed us to make these important changes, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank Council Member Vanessa Gibson as well for her help in getting Staten Island into the 21st century. We are proud to say that the funding increase in 17 was put to good use, and in the last two years, uh, our size, productivity, and success in key issue areas have all dramatically increased, and I'll just highlight a few. We increased the number of felony trials by 200, 
uh, percent in 2016 and 100 percent in 2017, taking them from just eight uh, in 2015 to 22 uh, in 2017. And in criminal court and Supreme Court last year, we had a 100 percent conviction rate. We've improved the case processing and reducing the backlog of cases. We have reduced our average arrest to arraignment time by over 10 percent year over year. We implemented and are currently upgrading our case management system, moving towards a paperless system. We implemented arrest alerts. We upgraded our website and began using social media to better communicate with the public and increase transparency for the office. And I'm very proud that we created a separate and distinct Domestic Violence Bureau. <clears throat> in addition to working in collaboration with that bureau, we created a victim service unit and we added staff. Now, as you know and as you've heard, the heroin and opioid crisis not only ravages our country, but it also affects our city very dramatically, and Staten Island uh, is really sadly on the front lines of that effort. I'm glad to say um, that we've been fighting that uh, battle in different ways. When we first came into office, we initiated the Overdose Response Initiative, uh, and uh, we started the HOPE program, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Uh, but uh, f from year over year, for the first time, we saw a decrease in overdose deaths of close to 20, of 25 percent in Staten Island from 2016 to 2017. And a lot of this is thanks to the resources that you provided uh, to our office and the great partnership we have with the men and women of the New York Police Department. Now, the HOPE program started uh, in January of 2017. We just celebrated the one-year anniversary. Uh, and this is a uh, post-arrest pre-arraignment diversion that happens in the police precinct to individuals who are charged with misdemeanor possession and are eligible for a desk appearance ticket. Instead of being uh, uh, told to come back in 30 days, they're told to come back in seven days and are met at the precinct by a peer mentor who explains to them that if they are willing to be assessed at a resource and recovery center um, and start uh, a program that's uh, prescribed for them individually, uh, then their case will be adjourned for another 30 days, uh, during which time if they meaningfully engage, as determined by the providers, we will uh, decline to prosecute that case. Um, and so far, we've offered that to 375 individuals. 88% of those uh, offered the program enrolled in it, and 90% of those who have enrolled uh, meaningfully have meaningfully engaged and have had their cases withdrawn and their arrests sealed. Now, I want you to know that every day uh, I look uh, out from Staten Island to see what uh, the, uh, my great colleagues, uh, who are not only leaders in criminal justice in the city of New York, uh, but in the state and the country are doing, and we emulate a lot of their programs. But I'm very proud of the fact that, as you heard here today, uh, they are uh, following in some shape or form uh, this whole program. And it makes us on Staten Island very proud. Uh, and we think it's a very effective way to uh, address the, pr uh, the problem. It wouldn't be possible without the extra ADAs you allowed us to hire and also uh, two clinicians and a statistician who work uh, in the office uh, on this program. In addition to the whole program, we created an anti-violence firearms unit to harness the best trained focused prosecutors on our firearms cases. We created an animal cruelty uh, prosecution unit we created an elder abuse unit, and we created Economic Crimes Bureau. Um, these are not just creating bureaus, but it shows where the focus is of our office and the cases that we are working on. And lastly, um, one of the great tools that our colleagues were using was the um, uh, community partnership unit model, having ADAs and staff go out into the community to work with the community so that we better prevent crime, not only prosecute it. And I'm happy to say that our unit is up and running uh, with a staff of four. Uh, we also, following uh, the lead of our colleagues, uh, hosted a Fresh Start Summons Day program uh, where we uh, 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 removed summonses that existed against individuals who appeared on that day, uh, vacating them, and we created a Veterans Court, which has been very successful as well. Overall, since we came into office and as part of our partnership with the NYPD, Staten Island has, dec uh, uh, decreased, has seen a decrease in crime uh, by double digits, 10.7 percent since we came into office. But obviously, and as you heard from my colleagues, uh, we believe we can and should and will do more with your help uh, and support. And therefore, the budget uh, asks that I have today are the following. 
You also heard so well from uh, DA Vance and DA Clark uh, the issue we face with body-worn cameras. We all agree that this is a very good uh, uh, tool uh, for police and for the public uh, to build trust and to build better cases when appropriate, uh, but we are being overwhelmed with the technology uh, and staffing challenges. And so, like my colleagues, uh, I have a request of $150,000 uh, in personnel and 100,000 in OTPS uh, to expand our storage capacity. Uh, the heroin uh, overdose and prevention uh, and education program, or HOPE, uh, was we were able to do that thanks to a uh, initiative uh, provided by Speaker Viverito in this council last year for $330,000, and we are requesting that that be renewed. That goes to pay the peer counselors uh, who meet the individuals at the uh, precinct. And not only do they explain the program to them, but they give them naloxone training and a naloxone kit at the precinct. And it has, again, proved a very effective tool uh, in, in combating uh, the opioid epidemic. Um, a lot of the issues that the um, other boroughs face, we face in Staten Island as well, perhaps not in the same magnitude, uh, but more than you would think uh, for those who think that Staten Island, again, is that quiet little hamlet off in the mist, it's not the case. And we have some very uh, real life uh, city challenges. And therefore, uh, we are asking for uh, $150,000 to fund an Immigrant Affairs and Collateral Consequences Unit, basically one ADA and a paralegal, uh, to uh, better counsel the victims of crime who are uh, immigrants who could face or, or fear uh, coming into our office so that they feel that they have a safe harbor and a place that they can come so that we can prosecute those who have committed crimes against them, and also to help our ADAs understand the collateral consequences when charges are lodged against defendants who may have uh, immigration consequences uh, and therefore making the penalties, penalties that they face much more severe. Uh, and I can tell you as someone who's tried to get a handle on it, uh, the immigration laws are very complicated. Uh, require a certain expertise. Uh, we don't feel comfortable reaching conclusions that we are without having that uh, expertise. And I know that my colleagues have all started immigration units. We would do it the Staten Island way with an immigration affairs uh, ADA and one person uh, working in that area. So as, as a former member, you, you know what the bell means, and I'm not going to cut you off. No. Nope. But, if, but if you could, you know, encourage the other, uh, the remaining three offices by your example. We yeah. We would appreciate I, it. I will. Did the bell go off? I didn't hear it. Did yeah. That? Yeah. I was going to remind Judge Clark that in the appellate division they also have a light, but I thought, I thought no. And they didn't have these fancy mics. Yeah, no, I, know I, I got it. Listen, I got it. I understand. And I will do my best to set a, a good example. So uh, speed up. Uh, but this is very important. So let me just uh, elaborate on this a little bit, and then I'll, I'll summarize. Um, Handling domestic violence cases is much more effective, or the key to being effective, uh, is the earlier you speak to the victim, from our perspective, the better. Uh, and the way we do it in Staten Island is we do not have in-person complaint draws. The police officers make an arrest. Uh, they speak to the victim. They then the police officer comes to the complaint room, and the complaint is drawn up. And then we have to go out and try to speak to uh, the victim. Uh, and because of that, our dismissal rate on these cases is much higher than I want it to be. In Queens, uh, they have the model where they do in-person complaint draw up, uh, and they are much more effective. We would like to implement that in Staten Island as well, but in order to do that, uh, we need additional ADAs uh, and paralegals because we have to extend the hours that we are open, basically being almost open 24 hours a day because otherwise the system doesn't work. We don't have uh, nighttime arraignments in Staten Island, the courts closed. So we have a request for $200,000, which would allow us to do in-person DV complaint drops and greatly enhancing our effectiveness. You've heard a lot about ATIs. We are requesting $80,000 so we can hire an ATI ADA who can coordinate uh, the different alternative to incarceration programs. Uh, and a conviction integrity review unit, we have a request for $425,000 to do that work. Um, and then lastly, just on the issue of parity, which you've heard enough of, but I'll sort of explain it this way. We want to enhance the criminal justice system. We want to make it more effective, more personalized, more effective. And if you think about the old way of doing it, every ADA would have so many files, hundreds of files, and it would, they'd be thrown the file, they'd say, go to court, 
They'd look and say, oh, certain charge, we'll take a plea, good, next case. What we want is we want every ADA to take the file, to look at it, to look at the history that the, that the defendant has, to look at, at the victim if there's a victim there, to find a way that we can connect some problem-solving approaches to that particular uh, defendant in particular um, and the people in his or her life. That takes time. That takes resources. So at a time that although crime numbers are going down, if we want the criminal justice system to be more effective, you have to put resources, I respectfully submit, into the hands of the people who go into court every day and are ultimately responsible for the justice that occurs in that courtroom on any given case. To cut us or to not to give us the resources we need or to have uh, pay parity for our staff means that we can't do that. We cannot look and say, well, this person's been arrested for the 140th time. Should we just uh, accept a plea and close a file? Or should we stop for a minute and try to see how we can use an or type program or a hope type program uh, uh, to make criminal justice more effective? So in closing, you've got a, a, a panel of, of, uh, of DAs in the city right now who are open and willing, I think, to do this. But we need your help to do it. Thank you. Thank you. And you closed strong. Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Chairman Richards and the Public Safety Committee uh, and Chairman Lansman and the Justice Committee for this opportunity to address you on the mayor's January budget and its impact on my office. Two weeks ago, my office appeared before these committees to discuss bail reform. I was proud to hear from my staff who testified before you that the discovery practice of my office had been recognized during the hearing. That was very gratifying to me because I have publicly committed to making my office a national model of what a progressive district attorney's office can be by developing programs to divert people out of the criminal justice system and reduce the use of criminal sanctions by using data to drive innovation and develop new measures for success. And by focusing the resources of my office on the small number of individuals who are the drivers of crime rather than focusing on the processing of low-level cases. My vision for the Brooklyn DA's office is to keep the people of Brooklyn safe and strengthen community trust in our justice system by ensuring fairness and equal justice for all. I'm asking you to be my partners in realizing that vision by providing my office with the resources it needs to continue these important reforms. During the fiscal year 19 January budget plan, my office saw no change to our budget from the prior budget plans. But we are in need of additional funds for a number of items that are crucial to our ability to fulfill the vision of the office. Our office's commitment to reform attracts young progressive lawyers who share my vision and want to be part of what we're building in the Brooklyn DA's office. Yet, we have not been able to offer a starting salary that is competitive with our fellow DA's offices, and Brooklyn remains the lowest starting salary for a DA's office in the city. The restraints of the budget provided by the city limits the starting salary of an ADA in Brooklyn to 60000 We have made some gains over the years and continue to make every effort to increase our starting salary whenever the budget permits but the low starting salary does not allow our office to be competitive in the recruitment of those coming out of law school, nor does it allow our office to compete with other city agencies like the law department, where young attorneys begin their careers at a much higher starting rate. Additionally, our office suffers from attrition as a result of the low starting salaries and the inability to provide salary growth as attorneys gain additional years of experience. After five years of service in our office, our ADA salaries continue to lag behind those of the other DA's offices. In order to mitigate this, a request was made to OMB during the fiscal year 19 November plan to create salary parity among the DA's offices. We have asked that our we have asked that OMB fund our office an additional $1.7 million, which will enable us to increase the starting salary of ADAs to 65,000. We also requested $1.9 million in baseline funding to hire 21 senior ADAs to work on high-level felony cases. 
we have seen record attrition in this cohort of ADAs, and we find ourselves in great need of attorneys at this level. As we continue to shift our focus away from low-level crimes and towards cases requiring more long-term investigations and more experienced attorneys. It is my intention to move my office to a vertical prosecution, which I believe will result in more efficient handling of cases and more importantly, more just results. Vertical prosecution, where one ADA handles the case from beginning to end, allows ADAs to better assess the strengths and weaknesses of a case, leading to a speedier resolution. It also reduces the chance that the discovery of Brady material will get lost in the handoff, handoff of a case between one ADA and another. And crucially, it will improve the experience of victims and witnesses who will have one point of contact in my office and won't have to tell their story repeatedly to different ADAs. Vertical prosecution is a nationally recognized best practice, but it does require more staff. And while arrests are down citywide, Brooklyn remains the county with the highest number of felony arrests, 7,000 more felony arrests per year than the next highest county. So in our request to OMB, we have asked for an additional 80 ADAs, 20 per year over the next four years to increase our total ADA count to an average of 530. This will require an additional $5.6 million in baseline funding. This increased number of ADAs, more experienced felony assistance, as well as a higher starting salary will allow my office to hire and return, retain attorneys at the highest level and prosecute cases in the most effective and efficient way and fulfill my vision of a progressive reform. While continuing our focus on the number one priority, which is keeping the people of Brooklyn safe. This fiscal year, my office saw the end of several significant federal grants that fund critical programs within our office. Our young adult court, one of the most innovative in the country, was started with a federal smart prosecution grant, which ended in December of last year. We were unable to apply for additional funding from the federal government to cover this valuable initiative, and therefore we ask the council to support our request to OMB in the fiscal year 19 November plan to maintain this court with baseline funding of $138,000 annually. Almost after 20 years of consistent federal funding for the Brooklyn Rising Against Violence Every Day program, as we call it the BRAVE program, our renewal application of $900,000 was denied. BRAVE provides trauma-informed direct services to residents of Brooklyn and sensitivity training to law enforcement. Through outreach and working with victims, this program encouraged the reporting of domestic violence and sexual assault, particularly among immigrant, non-English speaking, and LGBTQ communities. The services provided through this program are essential to combat domestic violence in Brooklyn. Our dependence on this federal funding has left us with a gap in our funding. We're doing our best to maintain this program at the same level this fiscal year, but it's clear that the future of this critical initiative requires baseline funding. We are eligible to reapply for this funding in 2019, and we ask that the council provide one year of funding in the amount of 300,000 in fiscal year 19, so this program can continue while we seek long-term funding. As I mentioned in my prior testimony, the federal funding for the human trafficking program in Brooklyn ends September of 2018. The funding of 166,000 annually has been part of my office's budget since 2013. We have a robust and nationally recognized human trafficking division within our office that has been sustained with this funding. It is my belief that the pursuit of trafficking rings that seek to target the most vulnerable members of society and exploit them should remain a priority for my office. The loss of this funding puts that in jeopardy we ask for your support to secure baseline funding from the city for all of these programs, which are crucial to public safety for the people of Brooklyn. All of us are aware of the opioid crisis our city is facing, along with the rest of the country. 
Opioid overdose is now the leading cause of accidental death in our city, surpassing all other causes combined. At the same time, we realized that the old ways of dealing with drug addiction were not effective for many people suffering with addiction, and we needed to prioritize saving lives over criminalizing behavior. I am grateful to the council for providing $700,000 in funding to my office last year to develop a pilot program called Brooklyn Clear, um, which we launched last month. Uh, it's based um, and modeled much after the HOPE program in Staten Island, and I was happy to, to kick off the announcement with Chairman Richards and council members Mark Traeger, Justin Brandon, and Matthew Eugene. CLEAR is a pre-booking diversion program that dispatches peer mentors to precincts to meet with individuals arrested for low-level drug possession. The mentor encourages the arrested person to be assessed for community-based services, and if the individual engages with the program in a meaningful way, the charges are dismissed without a case ever being filed. We have contracted with EAC, a community-based organization that will provide case management, make referrals, and hire, train, and supervise the peer mentors. The program is up and running in six precincts in Brooklyn South. The pilot was only funded for fiscal year 18. I'm asking the council to fund this program once again and at a higher level in fiscal year 19 so we can expand the program to the rest of the borough. I've heard the bell. But this program is not only uh, a response to the opioid crisis, but it's an overall effort to treat drug misuse by deflecting drug cases out of the criminal justice system at the earliest point in the case. Uh, finally, I would like to speak on one other issue. Um, we have a capital request in my office to OMB as was discussed recent, at the recent hearing on the, the committees for discovery practices. My, pra my office has practiced open file discovery since the mid-1990s in the vast majority of our cases. I believe the practice accelerates the disposition of cases, but more importantly, it's more fair. Barring a concern about witness safety or tampering, and those concerns are real and very serious, I believe defendants should have access to the evidence in the case against them at the earliest point as feasible. I believe we can enhance the open file discovery process and make it a more efficient by developing and implementing a system for electronic discovery. E-discovery would also reduce the likelihood of inadvertent failure to turn over discovery because there would be an electronic checklist of the items to be turned over and a record of what was turned over and when. We will work with OMB to submit a capital request for server upgrades that will enable us to support new software for electronic discovery, and we ask for the council support on this request. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank you know, the chairs, uh, Lanceman and Richards, and all the members of the Public Safety Committee and the Justice Committee and our deputy leader, Vanessa Gibson, for all that they have done to help align the vision for Brooklyn with reform efforts. I take my responsibility as a steward of public funds very seriously, and I'll keep a careful eye on spending in my office. The money we receive from the city will go to support our effort to keep Brooklyn safe and strengthening community trust in our criminal justice system by always ensuring fairness and equal justice. Thank all of you for your tireless work on behalf of all New Yorkers to make our criminal justice system a more fair one. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brennan? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Chairs Richards and Lanceman, and thank you for the time you spent uh, with yeah, me I'm, and I'm, members I'm sorry, of my I'm, office. I'm sorry. I've been derelict in my duties. I apologize. I do want to recognize that we've been joined by Council Members Vanessa Gibson, uh, Carlos Manchaca. Fernando Cabrera was here, and he had left. Um, you. Powers. Keith Powers. Debbie Rose, and Andy Cohen is still not Andy King, and he's still here. Thank you. Uh oh, I think you gotta add some time on now. <laughs> Just joking, thank you. Uh, no, and thank you too to the rest of the council members. 
uh, and especially uh, great to see you, Vanessa Gibson. It, it's, uh, you were such a wonderful leader for us and such a great support. And I look forward to working with the new chairs of these two combined committees. I think we can do some great work. For those of you on the council who may not be familiar with my office, we have jurisdiction over felony narcotics offenses throughout New York City. And I'm happy to meet with any of you at any time to discuss any specific issues you have since we have citywide jurisdiction. I've already met with the two chairs and appreciated the time they took to hear from me. Uh, I know that you're going to bring energy, vision, and leadership to the terrible issues that we're facing with the opioid crisis. I appreciate all the support I've had in the past from the council, and I look forward for future support. Now, before I run out of time, I'd like to tell you the single specific request that we have. We're asking for $275,000 to hire additional trial preparation assistance and an informational specialist. These staff members will provide support to our attorneys conducting investigations, and they will help us meet our additional uh, expanded early disclosure obligations. We're also very short-handed when it comes to assistant district attorneys, but you may have noticed I didn't ask for any money for them. There's a reason for that. I only get assistant district attorneys when the DAs are able to assign them to my office. And if they can't staff their own offices, they can't staff me. So in the middle of an opioid crisis, my office is very short-handed, not for want of support and dedication from the boss, my bosses, the five elected DAs, but because they have to take care of their own priorities. This year, right after we had the highest number of overdose deaths ever in New York City, I got an incoming class of one. One, in the middle of an opioid crisis. It doesn't make any sense to handle things that way. We have to have a four-pronged approach to this problem, four prongs. There's reduced supply, treatment. Those are critical. Harm reduction is very important, and we've had a lot of resources devoted to that, and we also need very robust prevention programs, including uh, robust prevention programs in the schools. But harm reduction uh, has d done great things for us. I think without the naloxone uh, distribution, without naloxone training, we'd be looking at a lot more overdose deaths in 2017. The final figures aren't out, but when they are out, I predict we will have seen another record year for overdose deaths. They, it won't be as high uh, in terms of an increase as it was 2016 over 15, but it's going to be up over 1,400 again. And we need to do more. We need to recognize that New York City is a hub for narcotics uh, importation. When I say it's a hub, I want to point out that we had an absurdly large volume of fentanyl seized last year. We know what fentanyl is. It's poison, it's lethal, it's 50 times more powerful than heroin. In 2016, the cases supervised by my office, we seized about 40 pounds of pure fentanyl. Last year, we seized close to 500 pounds of it. 500 pounds with the nation's largest seizure in Kew Gardens, Queens, 150 pounds. And if you don't think that fentanyl is going to hit the streets of New York City, I'm sorry to say you've got another thing coming. So we need to put a lot of effort into supply reduction because we aren't gonna catch it all coming in. My office works with DEA and NYPD on some of the nation's largest interdiction cases. And we work side by side with the district attorneys who sign all our wiretap orders with whom we collaborate very closely on all these cases and who do some of these cases themselves. We need help. 
We need more attorneys to do this kind of work. It's very sophisticated work. We need to be able to retain the attorneys to do that work. We need to keep this city safe. We need to serve this city well, and we can do it, but we need the resources to do it. We are sitting on a big problem uh, that is growing and growing. Alongside all the fentanyl we've seized, we seized uh, a, a significant amount of heroin last year as well. So our total amount of opioid seizures combined fentanyl heroin seizures is up over about 1,400 pounds compared to about 1,000 pounds the year before. But despite that, we have not seen the kind of huge surge in overdose deaths that we saw 2016 over 2015, and that's a good thing. But we need to do more on the prevention side. Uh, the stuff is poison, fentanyl is poison, it's being mixed in with cocaine, it's being pressed into counterfeit pills, it's all over the black market. So anybody who dabbles in it is at risk of death. And we need to get that message out. I applaud the city's efforts uh, at everything that they've done in terms of naloxone, peer counseling, the outreach. I think the total uh, expenditure that I saw for um, their Health New York programs was about 38 million. But that's 38 million, which is primarily devoted to uh, one and perhaps two prongs of the equation. And we need to devote adequate attention to the other prongs of the equation, because those prongs only treat the problem after it's developed, right? We need to catch that problem before it ever develops. And that's what I'm asking for, for our office and for the benefit of all the district attorneys. We need that kind of funding to support our efforts. Uh, and I would also point out to the council and ask the council uh, to give this matter thought and to explore it themselves. Whether we can be doing more in terms of treatment and treatment outreach. I've looked at the numbers of people going into treatment citywide, and despite the fact that more people than ever are dying of drug overdoses, fewer people are going into treatment. We need to analyze why is that happening. I don't have the answers to it, I don't think you're going, you, you will find more people hopefully going in uh, on the misdemeanor cases. As you've heard from the DAs, they're expanding those programs. In terms of felony narcotics arrest in New York City, those have declined quite precipitously. So you won't see people going in uh, through the criminal justice system if you're looking at the felony cases because we just don't have people coming into the system uh, except for those who are inappro often inappropriate for treatment, the high-level traffickers. We are also uh, trying to track overdose deaths back to the source of supply and trying to find those dealers who are knowingly dealing drugs of death and prosecute them appropriately. In addition, we know that pills are often the gateway to addiction and we are continuing our efforts to reduce the supply of uh, of illicit pills into the black market because that's the way people are often beginning their addiction and we are uh, getting it in a sense both ways. We are seeing doctors who are prescribing pills for no legitimate reason uh, flooding our streets with illicit pills and we worked with the Bronx DA's office on a case this year where the um, doctors who are running several clinics in Brooklyn were also bilking Medicaid. And that's a terrible combination. So my message is we can do much, much more than we have been doing. We do need additional support. All the DA's offices in my uh, office need support for DA salaries. And uh, I could not be a bigger fan of parity because I have assistant district attorneys from all five offices in my office. And they sit next to each other paid at different rates, doing the exact same work. It makes no sense. We can do better. We can do much more. And I look forward to sitting uh, before you next year and reaching back and giving ourselves a big pat on the back for all the progress that we've made. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
see what happens when women lead. <laughs> you, uh, you, you stuck the landing, as they say. Um, uh, we've also been joined by Council Member Jumani Williams. So, uh, Mr. Ryan. Good afternoon. Uh, Chairman Lansman, Chairman Richards, members of the Council, members of the staff, I send wishes from District Attorney Brown. Uh, I've taken the gentle hints of uh, Chair Lansman, and uh, I will be brief, no matter how long it takes. Uh, I've, um, <laughs> since we've provided you all with copies of our uh, testimony, I'm not going to go through all of the testimony unless there's a you know, standing demand that I read the whole thing. Otherwise, I'm just going to jump to the highlights. Uh, again, we're very proud of our numbers, our statistics. I'll cite only a few of them, and I'll touch upon some of our programs. We've always, the DA has put an emphasis on, uh, since he became DA, uh, moving cases quickly through the system. Uh, we remain proud of our arrest arraignment time and our complaint sworn time. And those times are significant for the people involved, not just the police officers who get back on the street quicker. Uh, since most defendants walk out of criminal court arraignment, the quicker we get them to criminal court arraignment, the quicker they get to walk out. And our numbers, again, continue to be among the lowest, in, excuse me, not among the lowest, the lowest in the city. If I said among the lowest, I'd be yelled at when I got back to the office. I'm going to touch upon some of the programs that we've highlighted. Uh, the, our Office of Immigrant Affairs is now probably in its second year. Considering the demographics of Queens, that's a very important unit. Uh, considering uh, what's going on in the country, that unit has become even more important. That's a unit, again, we want to uh, in increase its role in and, and get it out into the community. It's been very well received in the community. Uh, one of the programs I really want to touch upon is our Second Chance program. And our Second Chance program is over 25 years old. And it has been uh, morphed into various uh, uh, different aspects of it. Uh, one of the things we've done now with Second Chance, when defendants get a desk appearance ticket in Queens for certain offenses, such as uh, 220.03, uh, some other offenses, uh, some shoplifting or whatever, we reach out to those defendants before they're arraigned. Uh, they're contacted and asked to come in for screening uh, to see if they're qualified for the Second Chance program. We do not talk to them about their cases. Uh, we invite them to come in, we invite them to bring a lawyer if they wish, and they come in and they get screened. And if they're all eligible for the uh, program, uh, they go through the pr uh, program. All they have to really do is present themselves for the treatment. We don't, uh, we don't overplay our hand. We ask them to present themselves for treatment, and if they're successful, those, crimes are, uh, those uh, uh, complaints are dismissed prior to arraignment, so they never actually have to go into the criminal court. We have a program we're uh, initiating now, uh, Q-TIP, Queen's Treatment Intervention Program, in collaboration with Samaritan Daytop Village. Uh, and will, those cases will deal with cases that make it to arraignment. Uh, we've uh, conferenced this with our judiciary. We've conferenced it with Queen's Legal Affairs, I mean, uh, Queen's Legal Associates. And we have an appointment set up to meet with uh, Queen's Legal Aid. And as soon as everybody's on board, we will be starting this program. And again, we will seek to divert people out of the uh, cr uh, criminal justice system. Uh, and uh, instead of giving them community service, which is not, it's, it's certainly worthwhile, it, but it's not the end game, uh, we sent them to uh, treatment pro uh, uh, providers, and if they're successful in that, if they show up, uh, we will uh, grant them an ACD. Uh, a program that we have which is unique, uh, not just in New York City, perhaps the state, uh, I just want to mention we have our Queens Court Academy. We actually, in conjunction with the Education Department, run a high school, and we divert young defendants uh, into this program where they can get there, I think it's not called GEDs anymore, whatever it's called, the high school equivalency. Uh, and we take uh, selective defendants and we put them through that program. Uh, again, our, uh, we're very proud of our various programs, including our human trafficking uh, 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 unit, which is something I'll talk about later that we want to increase. Uh, we believe we have close to 30% of the state's uh, convictions on uh, human trafficking. We also had the first in the uh, city's uh, uh, veterans court. And we're very proud of that. Those of you that attended our uh, legislative breakfast uh, saw one of the successful graduates of the uh, Veterans Court. And one of the issues that we have faced with that, quite frankly, is finding out who's eligible. Not all defendants uh, come forward with that. So our office, in, con uh, in conjunction with my colleague to my right, the Brooklyn DA's office, we lobbied the CGA agency 
to include in their interview to ask defendants if they had any, if they were veterans, active or reserve, or had any veterans history, and then they include that in the miscellaneous section of the uh, CJA report. So the court, the defendant, the defendants, defense attorneys in our office is then aware that they're veterans and we can see if they qualify for various treatments. Uh, we appreciate everything the uh, council has done for us in the past. Uh, we were able to increase our appeals bureau with some senior people, or our IT bureau, uh, with much, much needed people for, uh, to increase our technology. Um, it wouldn't be Queens if I didn't mention office space. Uh, thanks to support from the city and the council, we managed to make some strides in that area. Uh, the old Board of Elections building on Queens Boulevard, uh, is, uh, this, uh, we've signed a lease on. Uh, sometime in my lifetime, I hope they'll start construction, but I'm told that's coming relatively soon. Um, even with that, and if somebody can explain to me the difference between carpetable space and rentable space, you'll, you'll succeed where nobody else has. Uh, but we're still going to be short uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40,000 square feet, even with that addition, in addition to the space that we're picking up in the building, uh, what's known as the Darth Vader building at 802 Kew Gardens Road. So all of that will be helpful. Again, it wouldn't be Queens if we didn't mention the Queens House of Detention. We may have mentioned that a time or two in the past, uh, that it was our desire uh, for the, uh, to take over that space, which was then vacant, uh, and turn that into office space for the DA's office since it's attached to what is still considered the DA's wing, uh, a building that was built in the 1960s, uh, and I believe the office has grown something like 18-fold since that, uh, that office opened. Uh, it appears that the city now has different plans uh, for the Queen's House of Detention, so be it. Uh, you can either stand in front of a train or eventually decide to jump on it. Uh, we would say if the city, and, and we have not heard definitive plans for the Queen's House, it's our understanding based on the capacity that they would need for the, uh, uh, to increase the Queen's House that is likely that they would have to destroy the uh, current house of detention and build a new one. Uh, should that be the city's decision to do that, uh, we would ask that they incorporate into that design and construction uh, space for the DA's office and finally get the entire office into one place at, at one spot. And we think that would be uh, good for everyone. Uh, you've heard a thing or two this afternoon about salary parity. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, I, we've looked at it and I think our count is after approximately the fourth year of, uh, uh, of salary, our, our people start to fall behind. Now, part of that is because, quite frankly, we've been blessed with our senior people staying. Over half of our office is where there's more than 10 years. So that sort of uh, adds salary on the back end of our salaries. But I think we all have the same problem retaining those that are uh, with our office between five and 10 years. Uh, I guess if you're thinking in terms of baseball players, you're talking about people at their peak, uh, and those are the ones we're losing. So uh, by our estimate, it would take us a, a approximately two and a half million dollars to deal with that adjustment. Um, I believe all of uh, my fellow colleagues here uh, are, are uh, I'm, I certainly don't believe any of us are overfunded. Uh, I just happen to believe we're underfunded. And when we look at the numbers, uh, and I'll give you some of the numbers offhand here before I go back to some of these other things. And uh, I think we're the only office other than Staten Island that has uh, less than 500 ADAs. I mean, uh, currently uh, our office has 318 ADAs. Uh, Manhattan has 598, uh, uh, Brooklyn 526, and Bronx 565. Uh, now we understand and recognize that there's a reason for the other offices to be larger than those. But when you look at the numbers, uh, we're too small. They're not too large, we're too small. Uh, uh, Bronx right now has 247 more assistants than us, and that's 77% more assistants than we do. Uh, their arrests are more than us, but it's 12% uh, more than us. Uh, their budget is 33% more than us. Now, we are not coming here today to ask for 247 ADAs. We're not coming here today to ask for 147 ADAs. We're not coming to ask for 100 ADAs. Uh, we're coming to ask for 46 ADAs, uh, which we think is a reasonable number when you compare the sizes of the various offices. We're also asking for an increase in support. And if the button doesn't buzz, I'll tell you what we're thinking uh, in time. Otherwise, I'll just jump to some of the other things. Um, matter of fact, I think I can probably jump to that. Okay, um, a, a couple of programs I didn't get a chance to mention. Uh, we're very proud of our, uh, our DV unit, and our DV unit is uh, creating a program called Strategic Threat Alert Team. Uh, as many of you know, or probably all of you know, the biggest problem in DV cases is the complainant stops cooperating almost immediately. 
and this program would identify cases before the arrest, after the 61 is filed. The defendant always doesn't stay around to be arrested. Uh, once that 61 is filed, we'd get an alert. We'd assign staff to it to talk to the victim, to get that victim into treatment before the, the defendant can come back and re-influence that person. If I talk quick, I can finish this. So this, the, uh, the, what we call the STAT program, the st uh, Strategic uh, Threat Alert Team, uh, we're looking to fund that uh, to do it into two, bre two precincts as a trial basis. It's been very well received by the, t uh, the PD. We've tried it a little bit earlier, and it seemed to work pretty well. Uh, okay, I'm not going to be able to uh, top bridge it, but I'll do best I can. Uh, for the, as I told you, we're looking for 46 ADAs for a total of 4,700,000. If you want, I can give you a list of each unit that would get it. Or if you're happy with, you want the list? You got it? You got it in there. Okay. Uh, I, you got it? Okay. I thank the members of the council. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so uh, let me ask the Queens a specific question, and then I want to get to the general issue of salary parity because it's something that in my um, meetings and conversations with, with, with each of you, it has, it has come up. So just can you give us an explanation? Your budget um, in comparison to the other offices, and I, and I know it puts you in an awkward, an awkward position because you don't want to be competing with each other and fighting with each other over, you know, we want to increase the pie. We don't, we can, certainly we don't want any, no one's going to advocate for one office to take anything out of another office or that it's something that another office could get. But how, how is it that over time, we're at the point where Queens has so fewer ADAs than the other, well, Staten Island being different because of the population, but Manhattan, Brooklyn, and, and, and the Bronx. It's, it's the nearest one is, I think you have two, more than 200 fewer ADAs than either of those three offices. Your budget is lower, and, and we want to address that. I think you're at 62 million, and and the nearest to, the, to that is the Bronx at 74 million or thereabouts. But, but how did it come, how did we get to where we are today? I was hoping you would tell me, Councilman, but uh, uh, I've, I've told uh, my colleague D.A. McMahon that some of our numbers work for him as well, so he may be back uh, on this <laughs> issue. I, I think the key words you said were over time. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how it happened. Uh, I can tell you folklore-wise, at one point, I was told, believe it or not, it had something to do with the libraries, that Queens was so jealous of its libraries, it spent more emphasis on the library budget than it did on the DA's budget. I can't tell you if that's true or not, but it's a great story. Uh, and uh, as, we don't, uh, Trust me, as the budget matter, you don't want to get, get into a fight with the libraries. But I, I think you've just answered your own question. Uh, it's the way it is. It, it's happened over time. It's, you know, it, during the height... After 9-11, we went through one, and, and believe me, the, the, uh, our budgets were the least of people's concern after 9-11, but after 9-11, we went through one budget crisis after another, and we concentrated at that point just to maintain our core mission, do what we had to do. Uh, and we've done a lot, of, a lot of the programs we've discussed here today. We didn't get any special funding from, funding from the city council or anybody else. We just went out and figured out a way to do it. We became real good at that. We became real efficient at doing those things. Uh, but we can't, you know, we, we can't duplicate, we, we can't uh, laser print, uh, you know, ADAs. We need more ADAs. I don't know why it happened. Um, I'm not sure it matters at this point why it happened. We would just like to see it corrected. So, so let's go from the specific to the, to the general. Other than, is, is there some better way than each year in an ad hoc manner try to throw a few million dollars at this office and a couple hundred thousand dollars at, at that office. There seems to be um, a significant disparity that you've all described and, and some of you have testified to very specifically um, between what your assistants make and, and comparable government attorneys, whether it's at the law department or I've heard the education department brought up or the corrections department. Is, is there some way to, to, to put in place some kind of baseline or, or benchmark for what an ADA is in their first year should make and their fifth year and you know until you get to the point where you get really senior so that we can demand of the city of us that each office be provided some foundation so that so that the ADAs are paid appropriately and then you know maybe each year we can talk about which kind of program we want to fund depending on what the needs of the you know the community are 
But but is there is there a bigger picture that we can try to in a way to try to address this? And you know, if any of you have thoughts on that, I'd I'd appreciate that. Well, I'm going to jump in. Uh, we agree with you, uh, Chairman, that we don't believe uh, one office should be disadvantaged, or, or, but that doesn't necessarily mean taking away funding from another office. I, I would, we would be happy to explore with the City Council some, some way in which we tie each other's salaries to each other. I mean, I, I'll speak for Manhattan. Uh, that, but, but, the, but, the, but I do think focusing on caseloads uh, is not the right way to go. Um, w simply because so much of the work that we're doing today that is effective crime fighting, first, number one, is prevention. And it is actually now part of our job to be focusing on prevention strategies as we do with the HOPE program or, or, or any other num number. So I, I think a, a bigger sort of broader look as to the areas in which we're working and to try to create some parity might be interesting. Uh, offices like ours in particular are different um, we have about 100 lawyers doing sort of financial crime investigations, and though that's a, it's a different, uh, so do the other offices, but I think we have a, a far greater amount. And when you value those financial crimes cases, they're really hard to measure. So we've, we, you know, we brought back to the city of New York $1.1 billion and to the state of New York $1.3 billion from our, from our efforts. That's money that went right to you. Uh, and so it's, how, what's the value of that case? Is that, is that a single felony case? Well, something obviously quite different than a single felony case. So uh, to, to summarize, uh, our staff will commit to working with you on trying to find areas of parity, but I don't think, uh, I do think we need to recognize we, we, do, each, we do a lot differently in, in each office as well. I would echo that, but also, we have to also remember that year after year when we, when we look at these uh, things, and I'm just going to speak for the Bronx. It's like, you know, there's record low numbers of crime happening in New York. It's the safest big city, you know, in the world, everybody is saying. But even with those low numbers, the Bronx still, for some reason, ends up on top. So we need to maintain those assistance. And if we could work a way to, you know, do some type of step program, I mean, if that could work, fine. But at the end of the day, it's still going to be disparities or at least in the amount of money that each office gets because of the fact that we have different amounts of crime. Could I, could I, could I just yeah, yeah, let me, before you do, let me just say, um, Mock J is not gonna be here today because of a scheduling issue, so Director Glazer is gonna be back here on March 20th. And I've heard from some of your offices that data has been flowing to Mock J with the hope and expectation that there would be some kind of rationality brought to how our district attorney's offices are, are funding. And, and I would assume part of that is some measurement of, well, how much, uh, for want of a better term, how much crime are you handling and what kinds of crimes? I'm not, I'm not sure what Mock J will come up with, but I know that that information has been flowing to her, and that is you know, question one uh, for her on, on March 20th. But you know, it, it's, it's a little bit, um, it, it, there's a free market aspect to it as well. Uh, and I don't think it would be a good idea to have, okay, every, every five year ADA makes the same amount across the city. Uh, I don't think that that would be appropriate. There certainly should be some parameters of, uh, of parity, but the issue is not so much amongst or betwixt us, it's betwixt us and the rest of the world. So the parity problem is not that my five year is making 3,000 less than her five year. I mean, every once in a while you hear that, but the problem is that my five year is making so much less than a five year in, in other law, city agencies and other positions in the city or other places outside in the world. So it's really, it's a, it's a basic problem is that we are underfunded for ADAs and the ADAs we need to do the, the core mission that we have and then that expanded mission that we all wanna see happen. In our office, for instance, I just got one, 60% of my ADAs have five years and, or less experience and 50% have three years or less because every others have left and they've gone either into other city places, other state places, or outside of, of the um, uh, public service sector completely. Very few have been lost to other offices. So I think it has to be driven by what each borough can attract and maintain. And so there has to be some flexibility, maybe within a loose framework for budgeting purposes. But the bottom line is the bottom line. The city of New York and the, the, the mayor and the governor 
and everybody wants us to do more uh, with less, and therefore our people are saying, wait a minute, I can do better elsewhere. So the parity issue, it's not this way, it's that way. Yeah, and, and that's what I, what I meant, um, and that's what I've heard from, from you all. I, I don't know that the Bronx is losing assistance to Queens or vice versa. It's if you're, lo well, let me, let me ask you, where are you losing your assistance to? I, I assume some percentage are going to public, continuing in government service. That would be where you measure. Right, I mean, with all due respect to the good people at the law department at Corp Council, their lawyers are every bit as good as yours, and vice versa. And probably a lot of them come from from you. And you know, I don't know that they have the same uh, workload and stresses that you have. So we, I think, we lose the greatest number of assistance to federal prosecution agencies. So they will leave our office and go to a federal office where they can make thirty thousand more dollars a year or more. Uh, and uh, they obviously have the trial experience that they've developed in our offices, which makes them value addi valuable additions to the federal offices. So there is, there is very much a, st a, f a federal state disparity as well. In Brooklyn, I would say that the majority of assistant DAs who leave go to other city agencies um, just because they're paid twenty to $30,000 more for comparable legal services, and that's a shame for the people of this city that the people who have come through in these offices have put tremendous resources and training are leaving to serve other agencies. You know, I also agree that there should be some, you know, range in which offices are compensating their assistance in similar ways. Um, obviously every office has to deal with their own budget realities. One of the things that when you look at the budget in Brooklyn, it often gets forgotten is that we pay a, a hefty rate of rent in Brooklyn. So our budget looks like it's a lot more than it actually is um, because we are the only city um, DA's office that has to pay rent for their uh, space. You know, I, I um, am very sympathetic to another thing that I, I heard in, in, in many of your testimonies. The council is demanding that law enforcement be reform and that we, um, the DAs be criminal justice reformers and have conviction integrity units and this, that, and the other thing. Um, it's incumbent upon us, we fund you, to provide you the resources to, to, to do that. And I won't rehash the, the itemization that you each gave of, of how you use this, this money. Um, but a whole lot of it was not, you know, so you can lock more people up and throw away the key farther. Right? It was to do the kind of criminal justice reform things that we're asking. I want to give my colleagues the opportunity to ask uh, their questions. I do have one um, question f that, I, that I want to ask before that. Um, diversity is a big deal, this council and, and within criminal justice. I'd like to ask each of you, do your offices maintain and keep track of the demographics of your assistance, and um, could you make that available to us in some in some way? Yes, and we will. Thank you. Yes, and just remember that it, it's it's kept track as people self-identify, and we of course keep keep that, and we'd be uh, happy to provide it. Same in Brooklyn, uh, we will provide it. Good. Yes, and I have a chart here somewhere with me, and I'll try and leave it before Thank I leave. You. Is it a Jim Quinn chart? <laughs> it's, an, it's an inside Queens baseball. I love the baseball. inside jokes. <laughs> yes. I don't think our office does because I think the assistant district attorney population is covered by the five DA's offices. Yeah. They're assigned to us. We don't hire them. And so I don't think we maintain right. that specific information. Right. So I think we'd like to talk to you about doing that going forward? We may have it. We hmm. have it for the rest of our staff. It's just that because we don't do any hiring, we're not in that selection process, and the people are assigned to us rather than, we don't have control over that process. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have it, I don't know if we do or not. For the rest of our staff outside of the DAs, we certainly do. All right. We'll follow up with, with you and see what you've got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, okay, just a few questions. So I, I know we spoke a lot about the body-worn cameras, and I think all of you have certainly expressed um, some concerns 
uh, around it. Can you share with us how uh, the NYPD works with your offices, or a few of you want to just make a quick statement on it? How do you? Uh, how does the data sharing work, and what are the challenges uh, with the body worn cameras? Obviously, we know in staffing, um, but are there any technical issues around the body cameras as well um, that are coming? And has the NYPD sat down with you all to certainly try to iron out some of these things outside of the budgetary stuff? Okay. You, uh, you go ahead. Tell you. No, I know we we meet with NYPD. We have a coordinator now with uh, you know. Uh, support staff person with two others that are gathering it. Right now we only have five precincts, but it's gonna be 16. And uh, it's difficult. There are some sharing problems. There's, you know, there's some technical Just go things. into some of those technical, if, if, you, if, you, if anyone could take a shot at it. It's okay if you don't. You know, whether or not they share it or not, sometimes they forget, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. they do, sometimes we can't view it. We try to upload it to our system so we can see it at the time that we're writing up the cases, but, um, our physical plant doesn't allow it. Our computer systems don't speak to each other. There's so many different things that we're just learning, you know, but we have to learn fast because now it's happening faster. So, the, you know, the sooner we iron it out, and as soon as we identify those issues, they do sit down and work with us so we, we could try to iron it out because it's important that we get it, but it's gonna take time to figure it out. Uh, Chairman, I th our observation not a criticism, but our observation is that the system that was purchased was not a system designed to be shared. It wasn't a system that had the integration and dissemination mm -hmm. of the videos as part of uh, the system that they bought. I think we get our videotapes basically in, a, in sort of a drop box and, and we are, uh, it takes, so, so we are tasked with doing a lot of work identifying what relates to what, and then there are all the issues that were not purchased by the NYPD cr contract with regard to our copying and our storage and our dissemination, our redactions of, 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 inform of material. And I, I can't remember the point that's in one of my memos, but we're talking about thousands of digital images uh, in, in, in these videos, just in one video that need to be re redacted in some cases. So the unfortunate reality is I think we've been left to figure out the operations and the funding of this on our own, as well as the storage. So we all are facing the, that same problem, and, and, and I don't think I'm over, over saying it, but I'm saying it's a big problem. This is, we got, this is a big expense for all of us, and it's part, of, and it's, we're required to do it, understandably, but we aren't funded to do it at all. There were some issues around sharing. Can you just go into that a little well, bit more? Well, I think. On how quickly if, we share. One arrest could have four Ma more. Ma'am, if you want to. She's coming up. Please. She's coming Come up in a couple, up, say your couple name of minutes. Record. It's my chief fine. assistant. It's fine. <laughs> uh, thank you, Karen. <laughs> uh, an example would be that there could be a simple assault arrest. Mm -hmm. or, but there are five arresting. There are five officers or six officers involved. And each officer has you know, X number of minutes that each have to be, you know, each have to be reviewed. So there's an example how even a simple case uh, actually can be a very complicated and time consuming case. And, and technically I can't speak to each step that we have to do, but it's, it's, it has to be technically done right and then we have to share it ourselves in a form, store it, and then be able to share it in a form that we can give to the defense lawyer as well as the court. So there's a lot that we are responsible for once the video comes into our control. I mean, the software that the city purchased uh, is basically the generic software. Uh, you would think that a customer the size of the, the NYPD could have got it tailored for them. So for example, the, the arrest number or the 61 number or whatever, they tell the officer to put it into a certain field and it doesn't have any format control, so if they put it in the wrong format or whatever. Uh, when they first rolled out precincts, there was a quality control operation within the PD, but they would only stay with that precinct until they rolled out the next precinct. Uh, we only have one precinct at this point that's on uh, all three tours. We have five precincts all together, one on all three tours. And as this volume increases, we've developed our own system as far as, for lack of a better term, hounding the NYPD uh, into making sure we get the, uh, the, the video. But as uh, D.A. Vance indicated, you know, it, it's easy to concentrate on the arresting officer or easier to concentrate on the arresting officer. 
you have no idea how many other officers there may have been. Mm -hmm. uh, my nightmare scenario is uh, uh, Hollis and uh, uh, Francis Lewis, which is the intersection of the 105, the 103, and the 113. It is the busiest three precincts in Queens. If anybody ever calls at 1013 at that location, I have no idea uh, what video we should be looking for. Uh, from the first meeting we had with the PD, I took the position it should incorporate GPS. We should be able to put it all into one database, put in date, time, and place, 250 yards circumference, and give us all the video that was there. That's not the system they have. The system relies upon the officers, quote, pushing it to us. Uh, and if they don't push it, it's up to us to go get it from them. We strongly support it. It's good to have. It should have. Sooner or later, everything we're talking about is going to have to get done. We're just hoping it doesn't happen after some case comes down that uh, because somebody didn't uh, know to turn something over. Uh, it's something that should be incorporated, as far as I'm concerned, yesterday. And if, if I could, uh, Councilman Richard, so in Staten Island, we have, uh, we started in the fall, and we, by September of this year, we should be fully uh, uh, operational across the four precincts in Staten Island. Right now, we're one full precinct and one tour at the, at the, at the next, those are our two busiest. But we've had about uh, 3,000 uh, individual videos delivered to us, um, or, or that, that are in existence that we should have. Uh, we have about, uh, we're, we're at compliance about 70%, mm -hmm. meaning that the police officer compliance and our ability to effectively uh, capture that video <laughs> is at about uh, 70%. Um, and that's with 3,000 uh, pieces that, uh, uh, individual videos that we know. We expect though, that, um, that, and that takes in our office now one full-time person and another person half-time mm -hmm. that I had to take out of criminal court. Mm -hmm. So now I'm down criminal court assistance. Uh, and we expect that uh, fully operational, we'll have 35,000 individual uh, uh, snippets of video that we have to download, uh, push to us download, catalog somehow, and don't forget to look at and redact mm -hmm. if appropriate in certain cases, uh, in, in cases that we will have to, uh, and then to deliver it to the def uh, defense attorney. Now, that's just Staten Island, so that kind of gives you an idea. And I'm sure those numbers can just be uh, multiplied out to the other boroughs. So it is an incredible. I mean, if we have 35,000, the Bronx is going to have three million. I would mm -hmm. think. Serious? Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. 350,000. <laughs> She's great, but not that great. <laughs> and uh, oh, and, and just finally, the, all the issues, and especially um, hearkening back to what. Uh, uh, Chief Assistant Ryan said the ability to track who made video is very time consuming, often causing every person to be notified, um, brought in, taken off patrol to see whether or not there's video attached. But we also have a tremendous issue of figuring out how we're going to store this information long term because as we're looking to go e-discovery and electronic, uh, the ability for this office to responsibly um, store the image, not only the original image, but the redacted versions become um, very time consuming and, and expensive. And can you speak to, so around uh, transparency and accountability and fairness, and I know I've raised this with the police commissioner on how are we going to deal with uh, the release of video footage in the event of incidents? Any of you have an opinion? Should there be an independent body dealing with this, uh, you know, uh, what are some concerns around the police commissioner? Well, I guess I can, I, I can answer that since the Bronx had the first um, police involved shooting on body worn camera. Um, it's difficult for us. I, I'm in favor of the transparency. I think it's important. I think the body worn cameras are, are, are a great idea and it's going to help us with public safety overall. But when you're a prosecutor trying to investigate a case and that video is part of the evidence, um, I need to just have that evidence in order to determine what my case is about. If it's released, you know, to the public, uh, and I'm talking about body-worn cameras, surveillance video that people do privately, you know, on their cell phones is different because we don't have control over it. But the police department does. And if I'm trying to investigate, let's say a police involved shooting, um, if it's released before I finish my investigation, that means the grand jury, potential grand jury uh, members can be tainted because they saw something beforehand or they saw some of it and not all of it. 
Um, those police officers, you know, they have a right to see their own video, but not necessarily each other's. You don't want testimony to be tailored because they saw, you know, snippets of video of someone else. I would like if we, and you know, I, perhaps there needs to be a memorandum of understanding between the DA's offices and the police department as to how we will handle those particular type of incidents, but we don't have that right now. It's case by case, and the police department owns the video, so they do what they want. I, of course, spoke with Commissioner O'Neill when I had that incident, and he did speak with us. We conferred, but at the end of the day, it was his call, and I couldn't stop him from doing it. Anybody else? No? I'm finishing up here. Um, wanted to raise marijuana arrests. I'm sure many of you keeping up with this subject. And I wanted to get your take on uh, the disproportionate amount of marijuana arrests and summonses being issued in communities of color. And right now, I know the governor has formed some task force to sort of look at possible legalization or parameters around marijuana. One of the questions I have is, would the DAs or any of you open to expunging records around low-level marijuana offenses uh, if marijuana is legalized uh, in New York State? Um, and, you know, should we be prosecuting people at such high levels on low-level marijuana offenses? So anyone want to speak to that? For us in Brooklyn, um, in 2014, we started to decline marijuana uh, prosecutions of low-level possession of marijuana. We continue to prosecute cases of public smoking of marijuana, um, but the simple possession cases, we uh, stopped prosecuting. Uh, you know, we saw our numbers uh, go down from a high of 14,000 that uh, the, the previous year in 13. Um, to you know, four thousand and change uh, last year. Um, we think we can do more, and we intend to decline to prosecute additional cases. Part of our policy um, caused us to prosecute cases where people came in with summons warrants and low-level offenses attached to the case, and so those cases continue to be pr um, processed. We're in the in the middle of uh, revamping our policies, but we've already decided that if someone comes in on a summons warrant or some other low level of offense like that, that that does not mean that we're going to prosecute the uh, possession case, and we're going to look. And I think one of the issues that has been you know discussed uh, in my office is the racial inequalities of the arrest. Um, we see that it comes from certain precincts in Brooklyn, as uh, you know, marijuana usage is consistent, we believe, among races and ethnicities. And so we're looking and working every day to tackle disparity issues and what things that we do to contribute to that racio um, disparity. Um, and so, for example, as I just stated, the issue of when people have other low-level offenses around them, um, we are prosecuting those cases. Um, and we need to uh, re-examine that, and we've started that process. And I, I think additionally, um, we intend to um, do more in, pros in not prosecuting certain number of cases where there was people have been arrested for smoking where they're not causing a public nuisance. Any else? Anybody else? Want well, to I in? no, I I um, saw part of the uh, or read part of uh, what happened in the hearing that you had about the marijuana. And I asked my uh, strategic uh, enforcement uh, people to, to look at our numbers. So I just recently got that. And <laughs> looking at, talking about the citywide dis disparities, and they look greater in the Bronx. Mm. So it's something that I have under study now. And we're gonna look at it and see, you know, what we can do to address it. But I mean, I'm very mindful of it. I'm concerned about it. and. I will address it, but I'm not going to do it without doing the research in my mm -hmm. office and really mm -hmm. trying to get drill down and get to the bottom of how it's actually happening mm -hmm. in each of the precincts. Yeah, and, and the, just the point I'm making, I mean, should this be the city's biggest, I mean, I don't want to say the police department's biggest priority, but it seems like they're really prioritizing these offenses, and we, yet we have an opioid uh, epidemic where you're seeing 1,600 deaths, possibly 1,400 this year. And 
I don't know too many people who are ODing on marijuana. And I'm not saying we want those individuals uh, being arrested either. We think treatment is certainly should always be the first line of defense in, in some of these things. So just wanted to make sure we put that out there because it's something we're going to continuously keep talking about. Um, all right, last question. I guess I'll, I'll end with our special narcotics prosecutor on opioids and how are we doing? What more can the police department be doing? What more can we be doing as a community and city? It's really going to take a team effort to address this crisis. And um, 1,400 deaths, you know, pro projection this year is, is really worrisome. And so I want to know what more could we all be doing um, to be helpful in ending this uh, epidemic? Well, I, I think um, I might have mentioned I need a few more ADAs uh, yeah. if that could happen. But uh, the NYPD has a very different strategy. I mean, they're, they're focused on the high level cases. They also concentrate on um, fentanyl dealers to the extent they can be identified and then they track back uh, to try to take the most deadly drugs off the street. And I think that's all good. I think what we want.